It's just uh, over now two months since the law was signed, and uh, we'll, we will see. I, uh, in, in trying to encapsulate what is close to 3,000 pages of the legislation, as you know, uh, I have found the easiest way to sort of sum it up is to go back to the Obama administration's original principles and say, did we achieve the principles that the president set out for the country more than a year ago? Interestingly enough, the president never actually had a health care reform plan until about six weeks before the bills passed because he then declared, this is my plan. Uh, the strategy had been, learning from the Clinton years, to actually let the U.S. Congress assemble the plan, but to do so under an array of principles that the administration set forward. So if you go back to those eight principles and ask yourselves, did we do something at least uh, roughly along the lines of what was uh, envisioned, I think you find that the answer is yes. The first principle of the administration's was we needed to reduce the rate of growth of health insurance premiums. Translated, we need to get a grip on the relentless rise in health spending in the United States. You may know that our national health expenditures have been growing over time about two percentage points faster than real per capita gross domestic product. Uh, and what does that mean over a, a long haul? Um, bad things. We asked some economists to look at this in an issue we did on bending the cost curve at Health Affairs back in September. Mike Chernu from Harvard and David Cutler from Harvard and their colleague Richard Hirsch from Michigan. We asked them, what happens if the U.S. Uh, continues for the indefinite future to spend two percentage points more on uh, health care than on real per capita GDP growth? What happens is, over the next 75 years, 120 percent of the entire increase in real per capita GDP goes into health care, which is a way of saying every additional dollar the U.S. economy would generate would go into health care, and then some. We'd actually suck resources away from education or defense or whatever else. Uh, so now this is completely implausible. We can't imagine living in a country where the only thing going on economically is that people are either getting or giving health care. Uh, but, and, and of course, as the late great uh, U.S. economist Herb Stein used to say, things that cannot go on forever will stop. And so we have to assume that that will stop. Well, how does it stop? Well, the, uh, the Affordable Care Act is, has a bunch of pieces in it designed to slow that down. Uh, whether it is a tax on high-cost health plans, whether it is new regulatory arrangements to uh, look at uh, different ways to pay healthcare providers, as I'll say more about in a moment, et cetera. That really when you put it all together, the structure of it very much is aimed at reducing this relentless rate of growth of healthcare spending. Now whether we'll get it down to 1% faster than real GDP, who knows? Uh, there are many pessimists who think that we won't do that and in fact we'll do the opposite as we expand coverage to so many Americans. But we will see, at least the tools are in the legislation for us to do a great deal. Similarly, another principle of, of the President's was that we had to reduce a lot of our high administrative costs in U.S. health care, and particularly in health insurance. Did we meet that objective? Well, again, if you look at the provisions of the law, there are many things in place to attempt to do that. For example, uh, in private health insurance, where the administrative margin on some of the policies that uh, our insurers sell to small businesses and to individuals, uh, uh, they will typically take in a dollar of premium and pay out as little as 60% of that in claims, retaining about 40% as the profit margin for the administrative margin, the act of medical underwriting, basically, which is basically figuring out who not to insure, and, uh, and then, of course, the profit margins. Well, under the law, we will now set a minimum so-called medical claims ratio of 80 or 85%. So automatically, that's going to squeeze down on the administrative expenses for the private health insurers or, or force them to do that. Now, of course, at the moment, we're having a huge debate over what gets counted as an administrative expense versus a medical expense. So if you have a disease management program, is that administrative or is that medical? So uh, we, we will be in a little bit of a definitional war, war for a while on many of these issues, but the intent is clear. The intent is to force the system to become more efficient. Another principle was to aim for universality, and with emphasis on the word aim, uh, because we knew we were not going to get there in one fell swoop. Uh, if you look at what the Congressional Budget Office, which is our, the nonpartisan entity in our Congress that calculates uh, the cost of legislation, 
and therefore the effects, they've concluded that the, at the end of five years, we'll have about 32 million more Americans covered. That's as over and against uh, an uninsured rate at the moment of about 46 million. Uh, a lot of people look at that and say, well, that's not so big. You're still going to have 23 million people without health insurance in the United States. That is probably true. About a third of those people are going to be undocumented immigrants who were completely left out of the discussion. We do nothing uh, to attend to the needs of the uh, estimated 10 or 12 million undocumented immigrants in the United States. Uh, so there will still be a fair number of uninsured left over at the end of five years. However, if you look at uh, what was in train for us, if we hadn't acted, the latest projections show that by 2019, we anticipated about 65 million Americans without health insurance. So the fact that we're only, only going to have 23 million instead of 65 million is a big deal for us, uh, even though it's not quite as far as everybody would have liked to have gone, or many people would have liked to have gone. Another principle of the President's was that we have to provide more portability of coverage in the United States. We have this, since so much of our system is employer-provided coverage, we have this phenomenon of job lock. You know, if you've got ins health insurance uh, with a company, you want to keep it, and you don't ever want to go to a company that might not have it. Uh, you don't want to expose yourselves to pre-existing condition restrictions and all kinds of things that the uh, we had on our health insurance policies at the individual level that were very nettlesome. How does the bill uh, attack that? We're going to create in the country a series of so-called health insurance exchanges. These are basically purchasing pools that each of the states will set up. And the way I describe them, mo most people have uh, nowadays gone on at least once on a website like Travelocity or. Uh, Expedia to book travel, this will be the equivalent in health insurance. You'll be able to go on a website, input your information, uh, say where you're from, what, how many people in your family you want to insure, and you'll be able to choose from an array of private insurance options that will be standardized so that you can comparison shop. You know, when you buy a ticket on Air Canada to Baltimore, you know it's going to get you to Baltimore just the same way a ticket is on U.S. Airways, sometimes, I should say. <laughs> but generally speaking, we will know that those are comparable. The, in the U.S., we have very often, of course, uh, insurance policies that differ radically from one to another, but you don't find that out till you read the very, very fine print. So the notion of sort of creating standardized marketplaces, which, this was, which the law would do, where you will be able to compare, say, the Aetna plan against the United plan and know that the silver Aetna plan is the same value as the silver uh, United plan and the gold Aetna plan is the same as the gold United plan consistently uh, across the board will be a huge, huge uh, advantage for us. And of course, because uh, there are some additional features in the law that will require there to be at least a couple of national plans available, there will be finally true portability of coverage for many Americans. They will be able to go online in Oregon and buy a product that is comparable to the one they would buy in another part of the country, and then if they moved, they could keep it with them. So these are uh, sound like very elementary advances, uh, but they're going to be, I think, very important structural changes for our system. And in addition to that, of course, we're putting in place a new set of subsidies that will enable people to buy it, and the subsidies will be available at least to some degree to, to people with family incomes as high as about $90,000 US for a family of four. And since our now uh, our average health insurance policy uh, for a family runs about $16,000 a year, that will be a, there will be, there's obviously we're essentially going to be imposing significant costs on individuals to buy these policies, but in exchange, we will be subsidizing up to a relatively high level of income. In addition to that, as you know, we're also going to rat radically expand our Medicaid program, which Medicaid was the program we put in place in 1965 to cover the poor, and indeed it has covered about half of the poor uh, all these years, so we will now finally expand that, take the eligibility for Medicaid up to 1.3 times our federal poverty level, so even higher than the nominal poverty rate will be covered in Medicaid. That also is a huge advance. So looking at the big picture, will we have met a very 
not, not again gotten all the way to either universal coverage or po complete portability of coverage, but we will have made very significant progress.